Good morning. It's good to see you. Let's stand and bless the Lord together. Sing this. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name in a land that is plentiful, with streams of abundance flow. this great hymn together, Redeemed How I Love to Proclaim It. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed through His infinite mercy, His child and forever. i 
redeemed him. He has redeemed you. Amen. Let's sing this one. I know I shall see in his beauty the king in whose love I delight, who lovingly guarded my footsteps and given me songs in the Turn to somebody real quick and say, I am redeemed. I am redeemed. If you are redeemed today, it's because of the grace of God. By grace are you saved. Through faith, not of yourselves. It's nothing we could have done for ourselves. It is the gift of God. Listen as Rachel leads us and sings this thing. When I think about the Lord, how he saved how he raised me, how he filled me with the Holy Ghost, how he healed me to the uttermost. When I think about the Lord, how he picked me up and turned me around, how he placed my feet on solid ground. Sing that with us when I think. When I think about the Lord, how He saved me, how He raised me, how He filled me with the Holy Ghost, how He healed me to the uttermost. When I think about the Lord, how He picked me up and turned me around, how He placed my feet on solid ground.
bound up in shackles of all my failures, wondering how long is this gonna last? Then you look at this prisoner and say to me, son, Stop fighting a fight, it's already been won, and I am redeemed. Thank you, Tyler. Thanks, John. I hate long transitions. You know I do. <laughs> Amen. Take your Bible this morning and go to the book of Exodus, 
We are in the life of Moses during these days for the next uh, few weeks yet. And uh, this morning we come to a chapter I've never preached on. I don't know that I've ever really studied. And while I've read the Bible through several, several times, when I got here, I couldn't even remember reading what I read. And I said, wow, how did I miss this? In the life of Moses, from the Nile to Mount Nebo. Now, I have to confess, I've already preached the last sermon in this series I'm going to preach. But I preached it in my home church last Sunday. I, I cheated. I, I warmed up on them for you. But I'm preaching on lessons from Pisgah, which is my hometown. And uh, we'll get to Nebo, to Pisgah, the lessons from Pisgah. We'll see that in about three weeks when we come to bury Moses. Uh, but we find him today ratifying the covenant between God and his people. We've had the Passover. He's received the Ten Commandments. God's given him the law in chapters 20, 21, 22, and 23. And all of the instruction of the beginning of the law is found. And then Moses is called back to the mountain. And that's where we find him today. After he received and heard the Ten Commandments, and after he heard the law, he, he is called for a meeting what I would call the Old Testament transfiguration account where God does something remarkable. Exodus 24, verses 1 and 2 are uh, tied more to chapter 23. Look at that. Then he said to Moses, come up uh, to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, those are Aaron's sons, and 70 of the elders of Israel. Now, you know they, they don't have the priesthood yet. Sacrificial system's really not in place. Uh, the nation of Israel has really not been formed. But here we have early Aaron who is going to be the head of the Levitical priesthood and his children and his children's 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 children as that tribe of Levi brings the priest. But we don't have it yet, but God is giving us a foreshadowing here. Moses, you and Aaron come up and bring the boys, Nadab and Abihu. Now you remember, God's going to kill these first two priests. Nadab and Abihu did it wrong. Just because you're in God's family doesn't mean you can't mess up. They mishandled the power of God and God struck them down. So bring Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and then bring 70 elders from the 12 tribes. Bring different ones. That number 70 is so very important in the Old Testament. And they ascend to the hill, but he says... They'll worship at a distance. Moses alone, however, will come near to the Lord, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people come up with him. That kind of belongs to chapter 23. I believe chapter 24 really would begin in verse 3. So there's a new thought here. Look at it. Then Moses came and recounted to the people, he's coming down speaking, and all the words of the Lord and all the ordinances, and all the people answered with one voice and said, let's all read that together with one voice. This is what Israel said. Here we go. All the words which the Lord has spoken, we will do. That's what they all said. Moses spoke the law, and they all said together, we'll do it. Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. Then he arose early in the morning and he built an altar at the foot of the mountain with 12 pillars for the 12 tribes of Israel. He sent young men of the sons of Israel and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as peace offerings to the Lord. Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins and the other half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of all the people and said, all that the Lord has spoken we will do and we will be obedient. So Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, behold, 
the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Then Moses went up with Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the 70 of the elders of Israel. Look at this. And they saw the God of Israel. Now, son, that's church meeting right there. Moses and Aaron, they dabbed my by you in 70, went up and they saw the God of Israel. And under his feet, there appeared to be a pavement of sapphire as clear as the sky itself. I flew back from uh, Orlando yesterday just after a big storm. As a matter of fact, the Navy let us cut across uh, the corner of the Gulf of Mexico. You usually don't get to do that. you got to go up and around and follow I-10 the long way. But the pilot said they've given permission and we can make up time, and we cut across. And I looked down. I was in that. You could see the water, and then you looked up, and the sky, it, it doesn't have a top. It, it, it's blue, but it doesn't have a top. It just goes. He says in this text that the pavement on the throne of God was as clear as the sky itself. Hmm. Yet he did not stretch out his hand against the nobles of the sons of Israel, and they saw God, look at this, and they ate, and drank. Now that is a fellowship supper. Wow. They see him. The pavement is as clear as the sky. They see God, it says. And they ate and they drank. Now the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and remain there, and I will give you the stone tablets with the law and the commandment which I have written for their instruction. What in the world is going on? It's the great interlude passage. From 20, 21, 22, and 23, we got the law. Chapter 24, they, they go up and, and they see God. And then beginning in chapter 25 and running almost to the end of the book of Exodus, Moses is going to have another revelation where he receives the blueprint for the tabernacle. So it's between the law and the blueprint for the tabernacle. God calls the servant, Moses, up to the mountain, and he has there an Old Testament transfiguration. They see God. Now, the Bible says that no man has ever seen God and lived. If you look on God, you die. Even Moses, when he saw him before, could only look on the hind part, and God hid him in the cleft of the rock. I believe that the Scripture is true. When a man gazed on God in the Old Testament, he died. I don't believe they saw the Godhead here. I believe they saw Jesus Christ, who would soon to be born as the Nazarene. I believe they had a theophany, uh, and there in that epiphany, I mean, they had an epiphany when they saw the Lord and God revealed himself in the person of Christ, but they even couldn't look on his face. All they saw was the pavement uh, at his feet. I don't even believe they could lift their eyes up to God. He was so holy, they couldn't even look, look to Jesus. They, they were looking uh, on the platform of the pavement. It was as clear as the blue sky. And then God reveals himself to them. And they eat and drink. Covenant was formed. If you don't understand covenant in Scripture, you will miss the gospel. You will miss I am redeemed. You see, a covenant is an alliance an ordinance or an agreement between two persons or between God and people. It can be this way or this way. It is both horizontal, man to man, heart to heart, and is also man to God. In this text, both of those things occur. We find the covenant God with man, and we find covenant man 
to man. There's seven great covenants in the Bible. I don't have time to outline all of those for you today. I'll do that another time. But there's seven of those covenants. Six of those covenants are non-conditional. God just does it. But in this one, it's the conditional covenant. God says he's going to do some things and he gives the law and he only blesses as they obey this particular part of the covenant. Now, when you're in covenant, you can violate a covenant. You're in covenant with a person. You can violate that covenant. You can be in covenant with God and you can violate that covenant. Nadab and Abihu did. As a matter of fact, everybody in this deal is going to violate it. Because everybody's going to die. None of them, none of them that left Egypt were going into Canaan. They died under the bleaching, blaring, burning, blistering sun. Only their children and their children's children, along with the twelve, or the two, Caleb and Joshua, were allowed to go in. Dear friend, be very careful violating the covenant of God in which you enter into. It does not mean you're going to hell. You don't lose your salvation. I'm just telling you, judgment falls when you breach covenant with holy God. That covenant with the Father. And then the covenant man to man is so very important. That's why the body life of the church is so important. We're in covenant one with another. Amen. And this covenant, while it can be broken by man, never ever in Scripture do you find God breaking covenant. Exodus 2.24, Exodus 6.5 says that God always remembered the covenant. Amen. He never forgets you. He always remembers the covenant. God is always faithful in covenant relationship with us. And we should always be in covenant relationship one with another. Now this morning, I, I got enough stuff to stay here till the faith service starts, all right? But, so I'm just trying to boil this down to get us to the covenant. I want to show you three simple truths about the covenant and then try to, to land this airplane before the next group has to come in, all right? Three things. Now, notice it. In verse number seven, he took the book of the covenant. Verse number eight, behold the blood of the covenant. A preacher that's got two brain cells has already found two points of this sermon. There's the blood of the covenant. There's the book of the covenant. And if he's going to be a real Bible preacher, there's got to be a third B somewhere in this text. It's there. Let's find it. What are the three things? First of all, there is the blood of the covenant. Notice what Moses did. When he went up, God told him, he said, come to the edge of the mountain. So he comes to the edge of Sinai and he builds an altar. He, he builds an altar to worship and then he, he builds 12 pillars. He puts 12, one for every tribe of Israel. And then the young men bring the bulls and they kill the bulls and they drain the blood and they put blood in a basin. They hold the blood in a basin and the other blood he spreads on the altar. Expiation comes. Forgiveness comes. And we don't have a sacrificial system yet. But you see, see the foreshadowing here. You, you see that, that the blood sacrifice is on the way. It's coming. And he takes the blood and he throws it on, on the altar. And then he takes the blood and he sprinkles it on the people. They're going to enter into the temple and the tabernacle. And there's going to be a sacrificial system for years to come where they come with the blood of bulls and goats. And they're going to come with turtle doves. And they're going to bring that blood. And they're going to go up and the priest is going to take it. And there they're going to find forgiveness and and once a year, they're going to take that blood and put it on the head of the scapegoat and send it out into the wilderness so our, our sins go away as the scapegoat goes out with it. This passage is a foreshadowing of redemption that is coming for us with the sacrifice of the blood. Friend, without the shedding of blood, there's never forgiveness of your sin nor mine. It takes the blood of the Lord. Just listen to these verses. I've just jotted a few down. In Luke 22 and verse 20, where Jesus said in the same way he took the cup 
after they'd eaten and he said, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. It's, it's the new covenant in my blood. Romans 5 and verse number 9 tells us much more than having been justified, how? By his blood. In Ephesians 1 verses 7 and 8, we find that we have redemption through his blood blood in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse number 14 that we see how much more the blood of Christ will do what it, it will cleanse your conscience from dead work so that you can serve the living God first John chapter 1 and verse number 7 if you walk in the light as he himself is in the light we have fellowship with one another in the blood the blood the blood of the Lord Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If you're going to be in right covenant with God, it takes the blood of the spotless Lamb of God. I'm in covenant with the Lord today, not by what I do, but by what Christ has done for me. That's why we have that cross high and lifted up in that window. That's why that crown of thorns is around the bottom. It's because those thorns went into his scalp and the blood came from his scalp, from his hands, from his side came forth blood and water. Be of sin a double cure. Amen. Save from wrath and make me pure. Now some of you think that you're going to get to heaven some other way other than by the blood you'll never make it. The moralist says, I've just got to do more good than I do wrong. The educator says, if I can just learn enough. The socialist says, if I can just do enough good things in the social order to make my culture better. The ecclesiastic says, if I just get into the church and I am faithful to the church and if I come on Easter and if I come on Christmas and if I come a few other times and if I give a little money and I support the church. The legalist says, I find the Old Testament law and I, I keep the law and I, I, I am as pure as I can be. Dear friend, we are all condemned by our own sinfulness. It is only the blood of the Lord Jesus that will cleanse us from our sin. He shed his blood for you. He shed his blood for me. It is for, foreshadowed here in this 24th chapter when he sprinkled the blood of the covenant both on the altar and on the people. God has died for us. It's what happened at Calvary when Jesus went in the Holy of Holies and he died for us. And then that blood must be applied to your heart. How's that blood applied? It's when you believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that thou shalt be saved because he has died and you believe and you receive and by faith you come. The altar has been prepared for expiation and you then receive that forgiveness when you say, here I am, Lord. I'm a sinner, have mercy on me. Thank you, John, for having us say, I am redeemed. I turned to Brother David down here and asked him. He gave me the exact date when, when he trusted Christ. He saved seven years old. You need a day like that where the blood has been applied to your life. It, 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 Moses shows us the blood of the covenant. But now secondly, he shows us the book of the covenant. Look, look at this, amen. He says in uh, verse number 7, Then he took the book of the covenant and he read it in their hearing, in the hearing of all the people, and they said, All the Lord has spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. When you go back and read chapter 23 and chapter 22 and chapter 21 and chapter 20, you, you find the Old Testament law is beginning to form in those chapters. The civil law, the social law and the religious law is all coming together. And Moses, he was a great general, he's a hymn writer, he was a leader, but he was also an author, and he wrote it in a book. The Bible says that he brought the book, probably a scroll, and maybe they'd cut it, made the book, but it says here the book, the book of the covenant. And, and he took the book and he, he read it to them. And, and when they read the book, they said yes. They read the book, they said yes. I got on a little airplane Friday to go down and preach to a deacon's conference in 
Orlando, and when I got on this little prop plane, I sat in the front row. That put me almost knee to knee with the flight attendant when she sat down for us to take off. It's a great place to have a gospel conversation. <laughs> I had on an olive shirt, and she started the conversation. She said, are you a reverend? I said, well, I am irreverent most of the time. That's why I need a Savior. You just kind of got to kick it out there because you've only got a little while. <laughs> She's going to get busy, you understand. And we began to talk. And she asked me about the church. I said, yes, and I gave her a true life card. I said, put that in your pocket. And she put it up there, and I said, look on one side, tell you if you're in the Olive of Pensacola, come see us. That'll get you to the gospel. And she said, well, I've trusted Christ. I grew up a Baptist. I said, good. And then she asked me a question I've never been asked before. She said, your church, is it a prophecy church or a book church? I said, oh, say that again. <laughs> she said, where well, you're the reverend, the pastor. Is your church a prophecy church or a book church? I said, well, define that. She said, well, you know, a prophecy church, the, the speaker gets up and he just talks about whatever God tells him to talk about. But in a book church, they take a Bible and they read from it and explain it. I said, oh, we're a book church. That's who we are. And she smiled big and she said, me too. I said, amen. I said, would you pray for me that there would be a prophetic spirit on me when I read from the book tonight? It's not either or, it's both and. I know a lot of dry preaching goes on. People just read a book and quit. If you're going to preach dry, just read the book and really quit. But take the book. Moses had a book church. <laughs> and he opened it. And he read from the book. Dear friend, that's why we have the pulpit in the middle of the church. We don't have a split chair. We don't have a pulpit over there and a pulpit over there. And the Lord's Supper table here. We believe that the Word of God should be elevated to the center and everything should emanate out of the truth of the Word of God. When you leave here and go somewhere, you find you a book church. I like that. I'm going to use it till I die. I'm just telling you I am. <laughs> a book church. And, and, and he opened the book. Now, you say, well, preacher, should we go back to Exodus 20, 21, 22, 20, and, and keep all of that law? This is a foreshadowing of what Jesus said in Matthew 22, verse 34. The Word of God gives it to us. Look at it. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus silenced the Sadducees and gathered themselves together, one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, saying, Teacher, what's the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. Verse 39, And the second is likened to it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Look at verse 40. Let's all read that out loud. Here we go. Read that out loud. On these two commandments depend the whole, how much? Whole, the whole law and prophets. On my key ring, I, I have what used to be a master key to Olive Baptist Church. This will open little or nothing here now. I have another one like this on a key ring in my car, and it has a, a hole drilled in it right here. Because when Jim Boyette was our director of maintenance here, I kept complaining. I said, Jim, all these keys look alike. I can't get in any doors. He said, come with me. And I walked down, and he took my key ring, and he laid it down, and he took a drill, and he drilled a hole right there in it. And he looked through it at me, and he said, preacher, this will open the whole church. Don't ever forget it. I still have that key. It won't open anything, but I still got it. <laughs> At that time, it would open every door, and it was a master key. You, you got to have one of these to get in around here now. It's a key fob. 
Jesus said, love the Lord your God in covenant with the Father. Love your neighbors yourself in covenant with each other. The whole law is founded on these two commandments. If, if you'll take all of the law, the Old Testament, you take all the law, everything you've read, and if you'll love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and if you'll love your neighbors yourself, you'll be well on your way to keeping the whole law. It's the book. Now, there are things in there we have to wrestle with and understand, but I'm telling you, Jesus just had a way of getting, boiling it down and getting the point and saying, listen, all the civil, all the social, all the religious law, if you just love God and love Him with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your passion, with all your strength, and then love your neighbor the very same way, I'm telling you, you found the book. You found the book. He had the blood of the covenant. Then he read to the book of the covenant. But there's a third thing that's foreshadowed in this text, and that is the blessed hope of the covenant. It's found right here. And Moses went up in verse 9 with Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and the 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel, and under his feet there appeared a pavement of sapphires clear as the sky, and yet he did not stretch out his hand. Most of the time, he'd, somebody came that close, he'd kill them. But he didn't stretch out his hand against the nobles, the 70 of Israel, and they saw God. I believe they saw Christ. I believe they had the epiphany. They saw his feet, and they ate, and they drank. Wow. I've been to some great dinners. I've never read anything like this. I miss this. They ate at the Lord's table. We have a table. Friend, you, you, every time, like we did just two weeks ago, when, when we pass the cup and the bread, we remember the Lord's death. We eat at his table. That's not what that's talking about. You got to go to Revelation 19 to find out what he's talking about. Look at this text in Revelation 19. Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his bride has made herself ready. Been to wedding lately. And it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And then he said, right, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are true words of God. He's inviting us to a supper, the marriage supper of the Lamb. I believe the shadow, the foretype, in that Exodus 24 passage, I believe it just skips at the Lord's Supper table because that's where we are now. But I believe it ricochets to full prophecy fulfillment to the marriage supper of the Lamb. A Jewish wedding is a lot more fun than a Protestant wedding. Well, I'm day party. Now, we Baptists have become so legalistic, and I am not putting forth anything, and I will not change what we do. But lots of our young girls here go somewhere else to have their wedding supper because they can't dance with their daddy in the fellowship. But when they go to somewhere else, we all go there and, and the preacher goes. <laughs> and I know it's the camel's nose under the tent. And if she'd just dance with her daddy and quit, that'd be one thing. But then the concert breaks out. <laughs> and, and I'm not going to rule the concert. But I'm just telling you today that a marriage reception is a joyous occasion. And out of Matthew 25, when Jesus first talked about being at this wedding, and then in 
Revelation 19 when he talks about the marriage supper. Here's what happened at a Jewish wedding. The groom would go to the bride's house and, and there he would get her and they would make their vows and then he would take her back to his home or to some place where they would have the reception, if what we call it. It, it was their supper. Romanians have kept a lot of this. Romanians have a, a, a wedding at the church. It's two hours long. I've done one of them. Two hours. The bride and groom come. You do almost the vows. They sit down. The guy preaches for 45 minutes because so many lost people come. And then you do the wedding. In about an hour and a half or two, you're done. And then you go to one of the greatest parties you've ever been to in your life. Now, I'm not talking about little mints and stuff. I, I'm talking about a meal that they cannot afford. They, they've messed themselves up over there, and they complain all the time about it. But it's just the tradition, and everybody comes, and I mean, you've got to have meat and choices thereof. And man, it's, it's a great function unless you're paying for it. <laughs> but the party is on. That's the picture of the marriage supper of the Lamb. But it is so sanctified. It, it is the holy gathering of those that are saved in this place. And, and the groom has come to get us. We are the bride. And he's now taken us to the hall for the great reception, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And, and we will see him. And he will be high and lifted up. And we will eat and we will drink and we will rejoice and we will glorify in the very Son of the living God. Moses saw all of that in this text. Now, I got a minute. Seven covenants in the Old Testament. Don't have time to weed them all out for you, but they are the Adamic covenant, the one with Adam. That's one teaches how to work. There's the covenant with Noah. That's where the rainbow's in the sky. God says, I'll never bring floods again. There's the Abrahamic covenant. That's about the land of Israel. That's why Israel will own that land forever. You find it in Psalm 105, verses 8, 9, 10, 11, where God made the promise in the Old Testament and the psalmist wrote about it. There's the Mosaic covenant. That's the ones we're dealing with right here. That's the only one of the seven that's conditional. We find it, we preached about it last week or two weeks ago out of the 19th chapter of Exodus. Then there's the Palestinian covenant. That is where the Jews will go out and they will come back to the land of Israel. And uh, in some of our uh, thought process, if that's already happened, we don't know, may go again. I don't know, but the, they've been gone out. Now they've, they've come back and they've claimed that land. There's the Davidic covenant where, where the established uh, the established kingdom is made, and then there is, hallelujah, the new covenant that Jeremiah 31, 31 speaks about, where God says, no longer will I write the law with my finger on tablets of stone, but I will now write it on their heart. And the writer of Hebrews picks it up in chapter 8, beginning in verse 9, and through verse number 13 of Hebrews 8, he says, uh, quoting out of Jeremiah, chapter 31, that I have given you a new covenant. No longer do I write it with the stone, the stone of the finger of God. I have written it on your heart. He says this is the second covenant. It is the new covenant. It is, he uses the word better. It is a better covenant than the old covenant. He says there are two covenants. There's the old covenant, now the better covenant. There's the old covenant of the law. There's the new covenant of grace. There's the old covenant of the Old Testament. There's the new covenant of the New Testament of of the Lord Jesus Christ. Dear friend, you're living under one of those covenants today, and what you need to do is come to the better covenant, the new covenant, and put your life under this covenant relationship with the Lord. Now, I brought today, where is it? Yeah. I brought a wedding outline. It's one of the last weddings I did. These are my notes from a wedding. I start with the same stuff every time, and according to who's standing here, then I write down other stuff. Personalize that. But here's what I normally say. I, the man, take you, the woman, to be my husband. 
I commit myself to your happiness and self-fulfillment as a person, to your usefulness in God's kingdom. I promise to love and honor, trust and serve you in sickness and in health, in adversity and prosperity, and to be true and loyal to you as long as we both shall live. This is my covenant before God. Now watch this. Everything I've said to you in these last moments has been about the covenant here under the Father. But now, beloved, I want to take two minutes as your pastor and I want to tell you about the covenant going right here. You are in covenant with your brothers and sisters in this room. You got to have their back. You stand with them. And when sin enters their life, and it will. When they blow it, and they will. When they get angry, and they will. You reach out to them. I had a gentleman this week. I heard he'd been kind of wavering out, not here or whatever. And he's been a big part of our family for a long, long time. And I picked up the phone and said, can we visit? He said, Pastor, you beat me to it. I've been needing to call you this week. And can, can we just sit down and... And talk. We're in covenant. We're in covenant. We're not in a club. We're in covenant. We're not in a due pay and organization. We're in covenant. The same way that I'm, I'm in covenant with the Father. Now on the horizontal, I'm, that's why church membership's important. It's where you put your life's important. Your pastor's not going to be perfect, not as long as I'm here. I talked to Dr. Passmore this morning. He's on the way to preach somewhere. He'd tell you for the 17 years before I was here, you didn't have a perfect pastor. Whoever's coming next, he's not going to be. It's not about perfection. It's about covenant. It's about I'm linked up with you and I love you, even warts and all. Red hair and gray, I'm with you. (laughs) It's like family. Because we're going to the marriage supper of the Lamb, and guess what? It's Liz's favorite verse. We're not married over there. <laughs> we're in covenant. We're all brothers and sisters when we get there. If we're going to be brothers and sisters over there, we ought to be brothers and sisters here. Moses, Aaron, Nadab, by you, 70 elders, they came and, and together they lived and they died and they, some entered and some did not. But they were in covenant. Elders from every tribe. Covenant. The blood that you've experienced, your brother and sister's experienced, that's your covenant. The book that your brother and sister believes, you believe that's your covenant. The marriage supper of the Lamb that we're going to, that's the fellowship with the Lord you enjoy, your brother and sister enjoys. That's covenant. So two questions, and we're done. Are you in covenant with the Father? Do you know him through the blood, through the cross, through the Christ? If not, I'm going to ask you to get up out of your chair and walk right here in a minute and say, Pastor, today's my day. You're going to come out of that balcony. Take it. You're going to come. Amen. Come say yes to Christ. The blood has been applied to the altar. Now it's time to sprinkle it on your heart and believe. Secondly, Are you in covenant with your brothers and sisters? Now, there's an A and a B part. Number one, have you linked your life officially with this church like you ought to join it and be a part of it? And then secondly, the B part, after you have, are you in fellowship with the body? Are you in a small connection group? Are you fellowshipping somewhere? Maybe the choir is your place. Maybe... 
teaching them. The reason I ran down this morning, today was promotion Sunday in the preschool department. As you know, we're looking for a new director down there. And a few weeks ago, my wife had signed up, and Liz's first love has been to teach preschoolers. And she's taught preschoolers for years and years before she started teaching adults. And she's teaching little preschoolers down there this morning. And so I was asked to come in, not by her, but just to look in and see how's it going. And boy, it was going. <laughs> and she was teaching the Word of God to those little ones and singing those songs and opening the Scriptures. The book, the same book we opened. Hey, if you get it in them down there till five, they'll stay here till they're done. Amen. So we're in covenant here. Are you in covenant? Or have you got your nose been out of shape? If you do, straighten up your nose and repent. Get right with holy God and right with your brothers and sisters. Can I get a witness? Amen. Amen. Covenant. This is my covenant before God. 